Good morning, everyone. Morning. So we have the meeting minutes, and if you uh, are in the meeting, can you actually add yourselves to the meeting? So I don't, I don't think we have anybody uh, doing meeting notes today. Gonna paste the on the CAD. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, just and then we'll just give it another a couple of minutes and see if anybody else joins and then if not then we can we can start. Okay, so anybody, anybody, I'm gonna change it a little bit today. So I don't want in, in, in the interest of time, I don't want to, uh, you know, everybody to just kind of like say, hi, this is, uh, I'm just here uh, to listen in. Um, so if you have anything, any stand up items, any things that you want to bring up uh, different from the agenda, uh, just speak, speak now. All right, cool. So yeah, so I think I have uh, one item for the sick run time roadmap. I, I reached out to a couple of uh, folks, uh, Samuel Carp from AWS, uh, about getting more participation on in the SIG uh, with uh, Firecracker and maybe Bottle Rocket, uh, a couple of projects that they're actually working on. Um, and so hopefully we'll get something in the future. Um, as far as participation, and uh, we also have um, uh, another or project for or project from I, IBM. Uh, so I reached out to them, and uh, the pro it's a research project that, that look at looks at a, a kernel. Uh, and it's not quite like a unikernel, so in, it allows you to. Uh, run the Linux workloads. So, so hopefully we're, we're going to get a uh, presentation from them or some participation. And then, yeah, and that, that's the two items that I have. Uh, uh, so I think we, we could just move on to the next agenda item, which is the Quay uh, presentation. Uh, so Joe and Bill are on the call. So uh, feel free to take it away. Hello, hi, it's Bill Dettelbeck, thanks. Um, yeah, so Joey and I are going to uh, just co-present here. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Hopefully everybody can see that. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, how much uh, time do we have, Ricardo? So, uh, 
I don't know exactly. Like it, it, the whole meeting is it's one hour. So, but then we have the uh, other item. So maybe you know thirty to forty minutes. Oh, okay, that's yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Is it, yeah, is that enough? That's plenty. Yeah, I think we had planned for fairly short, even like only fifteen twenty. So we we're happy to take more time if there's questions and okay, go great. into more details. So that's great. Um, we didn't come prepared to, to PowerPoint you to death. Don't worry. Um, so let me hand it over to Joey. He's going to take most of the beginning of this presentation. Uh, and I'll, without further ado, I'll just hand it over to him. Uh, thanks. Hi, uh, I'm Joey Shore. I'm a former co-founder of Quay and now the lead engineer on the Project Quay and product at Red Hat. I'm just going to give a brief overview of uh, where Project Quay is today and kind of where it came from. Um, and as Bill mentioned, feel free to ask questions. We didn't plan to PowerPoint you guys all, all the live long day. So, uh, we're here to answer whatever questions you have. So uh, Project Quay um, came out of Quay.io. We were the first private container registry on the internet. Um, we actually started uh, Quay before Docker Hub was a working project or product rather, um, right after the Docker public index launched. Uh, so we launched at a Docker New York City meetup in October, 2013. Um, at the time it was by my startup DevTable LLC. Um, that company was then acquired by CoreOS um, in August of 2014, right after we launched Quay Enterprise, which was our on-premise version, um, same code base, just different uh, version. And then uh, Red Hat bought CoreOS in January of 2018, and uh, we then open sourced pro uh, Quay as Project Quay um, after that. Uh, next slide, please, Bill. Uh, so as mentioned, uh, Quay was the first private container registry, and as such, it has a somewhat unique history. Um, it was independently developed, and so it wasn't based off of Docker distribution, but is instead, even to this day, an independently developed image registry with no external vendor dependencies, um, but it is fully open source. So um, we're essentially, from lack of a better term, a clean room implementation of the registry protocol. Um, we've been implementing it on our, on our own since that very first version, um, at, even as the community has been making use of the Go-based uh, Docker distribution to kind of form the core of most other registries, um, we've been our own. Um, also, as mentioned, we use the same code base for our, both our on-prem and cloud hosted uh, version. It is literally the same container image. Uh, we just configure it differently. So we give it different secrets, different uh, storage configuration. We, we feature flag a few things on, feature flag a few things off. Um, and all of our release, releases, excuse me, go to Quay.io first. So this means that we, are testing at a scale that essentially no customer outside of Quayo itself is running before we actually uh, push it to our on-prem customers. Um, and that means that we discover problems fairly quickly because if it works for, you know, a million repositories and a hundred thousand concurrent customers, then we're pretty confident it'll work for a hundred thousand repositories and a thousand concurrent customers. Um, we're also the only registry product or project that has full push and push push and pull support with Docker clients um, all the way back to version 0.7. So we support the initial Docker v1 protocol. We support uh, Docker v2 schema one, Docker v2 schema two. Um, as of two weeks ago, we support with the experimental flag turned on full OCI as well. And all of this is bi-directionally and concurrent. So you can, using a version of Docker from 2013, you can push an image and then pull it using a modern OCI based client or vice versa with subtle uh, scenarios that don't work such as you can't obviously pull a non AMD 64 Linux image um, from Docker V1. But short of that, um, if you're just pushing a standard container image that's been used for the last seven years, it'll work at any version of the of Docker, any version of any OCI compliant tooling. Um, and this is part of our commitment both as a product for enter enterprise customers and as a project, we have a very strong belief that um, customers should not be forced into hard migrations um, of their tool chains um, unless there's no other way around it. So every time we we change our data model or we change our, or the API changes or subtly evolves, we make strong efforts in order to ensure backwards and forwards compatibility um, whenever possible. Um, to that end, we also have the OCI compliance test reference implementation. Uh, it's currently in PR, but it is being added to our CI CD pipeline probably later today, if not maybe tomorrow, depends on when we get the final review done. 
Uh, but this will mean that every code change to Quay will be required to pass OCI compliance as per the OCI compliance um, test suite. And this will ensure obviously that we, we aren't breaking against the, the proposed spec, um, which is, you know, again, part of our commitment to ensuring that we support all of these different tool, tool chains. In addition, uh, we have early access for OCI MIME types, particularly as part of the OCI artifact standard, which I'll, I'll re reference in a moment. And to that end, we've registered via feature flag an experimental feature flag support for Helm V3. So if you have the OCI feature flag turned on and the Helm V3 flag turned on, you can push and pull Helm V3 charts into repositories, similarly to how you can push images as well. Um, and this is again, part of our commitment towards uh, growing standards. Um, and finally, we are actually driving the OCI standards for artifacts. I myself, I'm on the working group leadership board for the OCI artifact uh, standard, which the initial document got committed, uh, I believe it was uh, either earlier this week or late last weekend, I forget exactly when we LGTM did, but you know, immaterial and exactly when it was. Um, and we are actively involved in helping to evolve the idea of what a registry is from the container registry onto a more generalizable artifact registry while at the same time in continuing to ensure backwards compatibility and also ensure um, strict adherence to standards at every level. Um, which Quay is uniquely suited to because we do extra verification checks on all things pushed into our system, um, which is another strength that we have. Next slide. Uh, yeah, back. Uh, so just Project Quay at a glance, um, this is just a high level overview. Um, and this obviously does not cover the full breadth nor depth of the project. Uh, we are an OCI compatible registry, as I mentioned, and as also mentioned, we are the only registry that is not only OCI compatible, but is fully backwards and forwards compatible uh, with essentially every container image API and uh, distribution format that has been released. Um, we have Claire image scanning. So Claire is another project that is part of the Project Quay proposal to be accepted, and Claire is our open source uh, security scanner. We actually have two versions of Claire currently, the legacy V2, which is currently used in production and the up and coming uh, version four, which will be, which is available today to, for testing and will be tech preview in the next product, product release of Quay. But you can use it today with Project Quay if you just add some configuration. Um, and we're continuing to obviously evolve and, and build that as we move towards uh, the first formal release of that. Uh, we have image builder support um, and not just image builder support, but full integration with uh, trigger setup. So you can via a nice UI based wizard, um, create a new build trigger on GitHub or GitHub Enterprise, GitLab or GitLab Enterprise, Bitbucket, or even custom Git if you don't want to make use of uh, specific APIs. And every time a, a push occurs in, in that uh, Git repo, uh, build will be triggered on the Quay side. Those builds are uh, sandboxed via virtual machines run under Kubernetes if you're using Quay.io. Um, if you're running on-premise or you're running Project Quay today, you can use the Kubernetes-based uh, driver or you can use a legacy one that doesn't have the same security guarantees, but we have flexibility there. Um, we also are the, as far as I know, the only build system that has full caching backwards through the entire history of the repository because we have the repository available. So we can do cache lookups that if we see that, hey, this build could be uh, benefit from a cache from six months or even a couple of years ago, we can pull that tag as opposed to the more modern tag. Um, and that's again, driven by the fact that we are the, rep the registry in that scenario and we can and do those integrations. Um, and then it, you know, we have um, a bunch of other features built around that integration. Uh, we have Kubernetes operators we're building right now for deployment as well as day two operations. Um, these operators are also part of our, our proposed project um, to CNCF and, um, in particular, I want to call out two. The first one is what we have called the container security operator. Uh, this operator is already available today. You can install it in an OpenShift cluster. You can also install it in a vanilla kube cluster, but in OpenShift, the console gives you some additional benefits. And it will actually, talking to a dot well-known endpoint, which could be Quay, which it is today, or it could be a non-Quay registry, will automatically label pods with their security vulnerabilities. So this is very good for actionable intelligence as to what's going on in your cluster in terms of the security of those pods without adding the overhead of a scanner in cluster or requiring that your cluster have access to anything but the registry in terms of network access. So it solves two very important problems there. 
Uh, we also have obviously our, our Quay operator itself for installing and managing Quay itself. And that continues to evolve into a full featured um, day two operator today. It's, it, it focuses on deployments, but we're already adding day two operations to it with the eventual goal, of course, of making installation of Quay as simple as create a CR in your cluster, a Quay ecosystem, and you get the full end-to-end -end experience of Quay. Um, we support multiple storage providers. Um, this is similar to other registries. We support, you know, the standard S3, Azure, GCP, on-prem. Um, we also support uh, OpenStack Swift, and um, we have a built-in feature for uh, geo-replication, which is built on top of the storage system, which allows for registry, run, registry instances running in, in disparate geographic locations to copy the registry binary data from location to location in the background, but even across disparate storage providers. So you can use Azure in one location and GCP in another, but, and, and you can configure geo replication. And as long as you've configured it correctly, the registry will be able to copy the binary blobs from one storage to the other seamlessly without um, any further uh, configuration, which is very powerful and allows for some very uh, useful cross cloud um, collaboration. Um, we have very, very fine grained metrics and audit logging. Our audit logging system logs every action taken in the entire registry product at a granularity level of repo namespace and registry available at each of those levels. Um, and that includes pushes, pulls, tag operations, anything, you name it. Um, and so this is extremely important for auditability purposes. Um, and it is kind of our, our, our number one requested auditability feature routinely. Um, and we are launching soon. Uh, it's already integrated today, but we will be launching into the um, on-prem products and support for not just using the database for audit logging, but um, additional logging providers such as Kinesis or Elastic. Uh, and this allows for growth of scale. So when you're processing, you know, not a couple tens of millions of logs a month, but you're processing a couple hundred billion in, um, operations a month, then your logging uh, infrastructure can handle it. And it's part of the reason why we, we've had that. Um, we have enterprise grade RBAC and auth support. This was kind of the raison d'etre of Quay originally as an on-prem product was to provide, as I mentioned, we were the first private registry product available. And so auth and RBAC were kind of the key found focuses of our, our, our product. So we were the first registry that offered um, robot accounts. We have uh, very detailed OAuth integration for external applications to operate. Um, and that includes operation at the uh, command line, so you can use auth tokens and robot tokens in the command line. We have integration with various <coughs> RBAC providers, um, OIDC, LDAP, Keystone, um, including another one we call custom JWT, which means you can write your own auth engine and Quay will just speak to it. Uh, on the LDAP side, we have uh, team sync, so you can, and as well as Keystone. So if you want to back your teams in Quay with LDAP groups or Keystone, I don't forget if they're called groups or teams, but same difference. Um, you can do so and the system will automatically synchronize those things. Um, and again, all of this RBAC and auth support is tied together with our existing um, audit logging. And finally, it is, um, it's tied together with our, our OIDC support. So you can actually use OIDC and our LDAP or OIDC and Keystone. And you can mix and match these options to, to kind of tailor Quays auth and an auth C to your particular um, needs. Uh, image time machine is a feature that is unique to Quay. Um, when a tag is pushed into Quay, rather than overriding the, um, the tag, we actually keep a history of that tag for up to a configured period of time. And that is administrator configurable. Uh, standard is two weeks. And that allows uh, users to, if perhaps they overrode a tag incorrectly or they needed an old version for compliance reasons or a myriad of other reasons to look backwards in time roll back their tag if necessary and, and at least know you know how that tag changed um this in, this in, this uh, feature in particular has saved my my personal bacon at least a few times where i found first a tag and i it turns out that tag was broken and it needs to roll back i was able to do that without having to keep extra copies around um i saw a few people said they were they came in late do i need to go backwards to to address anything that they missed or should i keep going forwards I think we can keep going forward, and if somebody has any questions, they can ask at the end. Sure. Yeah, we have a recording as well. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure, uh, in case anyone had any questions, I, I didn't want to just keep talking and talking. Um, uh, 
if anybody you you can you can actually request for questions if you if you like to you know during the presentation and if somebody has any questions they can jump in so yeah, yeah please I mean, speak if, up. If, if you if you want to make it more interactive right so yeah, no, I, I, as I said at the beginning, if you have a question, please ask it while I'm talking. I'll be happy to answer it now. It, you do not have to wait till the end. I had a question about, about who's using it. Uh, maybe you're covering it later. Um, yeah, yeah, I was going to go into that in the next slide, or okay. two slides from now, yeah. Um, I'll go through these last three items pretty quickly. Um, flexible deployment models. Uh, so while we encourage our, our users to deploy Project Quay via Kubernetes, and obviously the work toward on the Quay operator is, is, is towards that goal, um, it's not required, and so you can deploy Quay with a Docker run and a database and storage. Um, mm -hmm. So if you just want to run it uh, in a small operation and you don't want to necessarily use Kube, um, that option does exist. Uh, notary integration, so we do have support in Project Quay today for uh, talking to Notary. You can feature flag it on, uh, but with the work that's being done on Notary v2, another group that I am a part of, we are actively working towards the next implementation of uh, security, um, I'm sorry, uh, signatures and scanning stuff. Um, and that will, uh, we will adapt that work as it uh, reaches fruition. And uh, finally, I mentioned geo-replication, but we also have support for mirroring. So uh, in our mind, mirroring and geo-replication are kind of two sides of the same coin. Geo-replication is if you want to have a universally distributed single logical registry, while mirroring allows for us to say, to have disparate and distinct registry instances with one instance copying from another. Um, our mirroring support today is, is pretty powerful, but we are already working on improvements um, on our roadmap in terms of being, of being able one Quay talking to another to be able to leverage additional APIs, such as only mirroring images that match meet security scans or have additional metadata attached to them. Next slide. Uh, so this is the Quay architecture at a glance. Um, I'm not going to go through it too deeply um, because I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions on it, but at the high level, um, Project Quay consists of the Quay container itself, which you can see in the middle. The Quay container runs all of the pieces of Quay, our build manager, our workers, the registry, the UI. Um, in parallel to that, we have the Claire container, which is an independent container, but Quay and Claire talk to one another. Um, you can then run as many mirroring workers as you like if you're using mirroring. Uh, it's not, is there a question? I'm sorry. I, uh, I think, I think, I think it's just feedback, yeah. Um, there's some noise on background noise. Yeah, um, you can run, so you can run as many mirroring workers as you like if you wish to, if you have a lot of mirroring operations you want, so you can scale those independently. And then the Quay builders themselves um, run as separate build, uh, objects. Um, if you're using the Kubernetes based build system, they actually run as jobs under the kube cluster. Um, these, these operations are then run via the Quay operator, again, which is optional, you don't have to use it. And then um, Quay speaks to, for storage, it speaks to storage, the database for metadata, the Redis cache for caching, um, and then, um, and these are all generally configurable. Um, and then we have other things that talk to Quay via load balancer, including the UI, co customers, content, ingress, um, the Red Hat container catalog, and other things like the operator hub. Today, the operator hub actually runs on top of Quay.io via its APIs. Um, and um, all operators served in the OLM project actually are coming from a Quay instance, Quay.io, today. Um, can you, okay. Next slide, please. Uh, so one thing I wanted to mention too, before we start talking Sorry, about user. Quick, quick, quick question on the previous slide, if I yeah. may. Um, so are those, those uh, Quay, Claire, Mirror, et cetera, are those all replicated or are they multiple of them? Or, yes. Or, yes. Okay. So, so the Quay container, so both Quay and Claire are stateless themselves. The containers themselves don't store any data with the exception of local cache. So uh, as an example, Quay.io, we run approximately 30 Quay containers on an OpenShift cluster, and um, they're sitting behind a load balancer, and they are actually auto-scaled based on traffic. So as traffic goes up, we, we, we run that number up, and as traffic goes down, we, we, we take that number down. Um, all of the state of Quay itself is kept in storage, the database, and Redis. And so this ensures that you can scale Quay. As long as your underlying database, Redis, and storage can handle the, the traffic, you can, kind of, you can kind of scale Quay more or less infinitely. Um, which is very important. 
another question that I have. So the query operator takes care of the upgrading and managing the, the different components or, or how, so how are you? Yeah, so today the Quay operator, so the Quay operator today started as a, what we call the Quay setup operator. Initially, the very first version was focused on setting up Quay, but was not, was not focused on upgrade. We are working on the day two operations as we speak. And in terms of updates, um, there's another operator that we have called the, the database uh, administrator operator, the DBA operator that we, the Quay operator will be using. And the goal that we are working towards, and we are not there today, I want to caveat. The goal that we are working towards is you'll be able to change the version of Quay in the Quay ecosystem CR that you have. And then the Quay operator will be responsible for calling the DBA operator along with itself to do the, the upgrade in place if possible. And if not possible, it will take down the cluster, do the upgrade and put the cluster back up. We're endeavoring, we hope, to get to the point where the cluster never needs to go down. We can always do in place upgrades like we do for Quay.io. Um, even if that means putting the Quay uh, cluster into read only, which we have to do, we've had to do once in history so far, um, but the DBA operator would be responsible for that. So I, I, we have the pieces in place today, but it, they're not yet there in terms of allowing for seamless upgrade yet, but it, it is still faster today. So for example, if you're making use of the Quay operator and you make a configuration change to Quay, the Quay operator along with the configuration tool will redeploy Quay by doing a, you know, a kube, a kube deployment update where it will replace one node at a time with the updated config. So we already have the pieces working, but we're not there yet for the database migration side because it's a little more complicated. Uh, so another question about the database is, uh, is it a specific database or is it just uh, Postgres or MySQL or? Both. So you can use either MySQL or Postgres. We generally recommend Postgres because in our experience, Postgres is more efficient and Claire only speaks to Postgres. So if you're going to be running a database for Claire, you might as well use the same one for Quay. Um, if you want, but we support on the Quay side, we support MySQL, Postgres, and the Project Quay uh, test suite also tests Maria and Percona, which are of course variants of MySQL. Um, there is also, if you're just running Project Quay locally on your laptop, you can also use SQLite. Um, with the caveat that if you're using SQLite, you can only run one instance because obviously SQLite's a file. Mm -hmm. So for like uh, production <laughs> deployments, you you recommend uh, uh, Redundant databases here, or is it, or is it master yeah. slave? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we generally recommend master slave. Um, we do have support, uh, prototypical support today for read replicas as well, um, and that has been merged into head. Um, I have a PR outstanding that will add some additional changes to that to to address an issue that may hasn't come up yet, but may come up. But um, our re recommendation moving forward will be deploy the database Postgres master slave and then have one or more read replicas configured as well, especially if you're deploying across multiple geographic regions, you'll likely want read replicas in those regions to just make the performance better, right? It's not required. Um, we have customers today that have geo replicated uh, uh, Red Hat Quays deployed globally, and they're all talking to the same database in one region, but having read replicas will certainly make the, the read operations faster um, and more redundant, which is nice. Um, and yes, I know more redundant is in self redundant, but, um, and yeah. And, um, the other thing, one thing I should mention too, is the operator today does deploy Postgres for you. Cool. Yeah. One is of the topics that has come up, uh, sorry, carry on Ricardo. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My question is that does it deploy it, uh, the operator deploys it, uh, you know, in master slave configuration or it just gives you options. So. I believe today it just deploys it in a standard like Postgres container, but what we're working towards is allowing people to configure the Quay operator to choose what kind of, what other operator to use to deploy the database. So our general recommendation will likely be if you have the crunchy DB operator, which itself manages Postgres and a master slave and does all of the backup and, and, and failover for you, then you could just have Quay operator create the crunchy DB CR, right? This is the, the great idea, great thing about the Kubernetes ecosystem is we don't have to be responsible for how to deploy a database. We're, we're not necessarily the database deployment experts, but there are projects and products out there that are Kubernetes uh, compatible that provide this, these capabilities. So what we're working towards is in the Quay ecosystem, you say, hey, I want to use this Crunchy CR to deploy my database. Crunchy will go handle all that. And we just say, and give us an, a, D, a Postgres endpoint. And we go, great, now we have a database. Um, and then Crunchy would manage that as an example. Got it. Quinn, 
you, you have you have you had a question. I was I was just going to mention that in the context of a, of a different registry, um, the topic of of high availability came up because because this is such a sort of key part of a of a Kubernetes cluster, uh, and when it's down or unavailable, the cluster is essentially down or t to some extent down, um, and so. So master slave is all very good, um, but but there you know if if there's usually some kind of manual failover required in those kind of environments because you don't you know the master and the slave don't know which one is down uh, if there's a network partition for example, um, so yeah I, I guess I mean it's not an issue for incubation really I mean that's the kind of thing that people will perhaps ask you to sort out before graduation, uh, but just uh, yeah be good to kind of get on your roadmap like what exactly the high availability story is going forward because it will be a you know big question from the community yeah so our high availability story is around two separate levels of high availability so from our perspective high availability of, of read operations is much more important than high availability of write right if you're if you're unable to push for five minutes it's not the end of the world unless you're in the, you know a production fire but if you're unable to pull for five seconds it can be and so in our opinion, and this is, this is something that I've been pushing heavily for, read replicas are key. And right, so the way it works today in Quay, as of this moment, if you configure Quay with, a, with one or more read replicas, um, what it will do is it will actually attempt to pull any, any, any read-only operation, such as a pull, will go to the read replica first. If the read replica is unavailable, the system will automatically fail over back to the master database. So you actually already have redundancy there automatically built in on the Quay side such that if you configure it pointing to your, your normal master slave, say Postgres, and then one, at least one read replica, if not more, Quay will automatically redundantly check them to make sure that it can pull from at least one of them. So our, our, our belief is read replicas will solve the critical high availability aspect combined with the fact that Quay itself is a high, highly available design in having multiple instances. You can have it such that if you have at least one, a few Quay containers running, and we generally recommend at least three, and you have at least one replica, read replica backing your database and Quay is configured to talk to that read replica as well as the master slave, then now you have HA on the Quay side and HA on the database side. Storage itself is generally hopefully deployed in an HA state, right? If you're using something like Ceph or Amazon S3 or GCP, right? Like those, those are essentially HA storage systems. Um, if, you're, if you're using geo-replication, you have a backup of your storage. Now, while at this moment, in time, the storage failover isn't automatic. We do plan to do that as well. And the Redis cache is optional. So we're addressing every layer and ensuring that we have redundancy at every layer. And today we already have redundancy at my, in my opinion, is the two most important ones, Quay itself and the database. Storage, we, we hope, as I said, via geo replication to have auto failover some added in sometime soon, that's, that's on the roadmap. And that would mean that if you have Geo replication enabled, full geo replication enabled, and store and your primary storage is, is completely unavailable. You then have a situation where Quake and then fail over on that side too, and now you have essentially a primary and a backup at every level. Thanks. Uh, very very comprehensive answer. Um, any other questions on the architecture before we move on? Okay. Next slide, Bill. Uh, one thing I wanted to talk about briefly before I hand it over to Bill, who will talk about our, you know, customer use cases and, and, and numbers, is our testing suite. Um, and this is something that is fairly unique to Quay, and I think is a, a major benefit for the community. And that is um, our registry test suite. So at the high level, our registry test suite makes use of PyTest to create a matrix test. And so um, we have obviously a bunch of tests written for various registry use cases, including, you know, basic push pull all the way to, I push a manifest list and I want to be able to pull it via legacy. But the key differentiator here is that these, uh, this test suite is, re is matrixed over every version of Docker or every version of the Docker protocol, as well as OCI. So the inputs are a set of, you know, the, ver the Docker version protocols, V1, V21, V22, and OCI cross product with itself. So when you run the registry test suite, let's say I run the registry test suite with test basic push pull. What that will actually do is it will spawn up a Quay uh, configured, wait for it to begin. And then it will run for every single variant of this cross product, the test operation. So you can see here, if I run basic push pull, I copied this from a test run a couple of days ago, I get it ran push with OCI, 
pull with version one of, of the Docker protocol, push with OCI, pull with V2.1, push with OCI, pull with V2.2, push with OCI, pull with OCI. Continue, push with V1, pull with V1, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this does make our CI a little slower because we have to run running the cross product of what is essentially 50 to 100 tests in this regard ends up with, I don't know, two to 4,000 tests, if I recall, somewhere in there. But it does mean that we have comprehensive coverage for every version of every protocol of every API that we, that we run. And adding tests is pretty straightforward because you can then just write new tests that make use of the pusher pullers and mix and match these as you want. And this has caught so many bugs, not only with our own implementation, but actually with um, Docker as well as some of the OCI work. Um, because as we added support, um, we were able to say, oh, if we push with V1 in this certain scenario and then try to pull with OCI, the system doesn't know what to do because there's some you know, miscompatibility there. And we were able to submit uh, fixes to various um, proposals as a result. And the other aspect I should mention here is you'll notice it says on the far right, it says OCI model. Now, it only says OCI model today because Quay, at, as of this moment, thankfully, has finished its, mo its data model migration. But um, if anyone watched my talk that I gave a couple of weeks ago, and if not, I'll be happy to send out a link. Um, we actually had to migrate Quay's data model from a pre-OCI model back when everything was based on images uh, to an OCI model, but to where everything was based off of manifests. Um, and we actually were able to do so partially because of this test suite where we just added another cross product where we ran the pre-OCI model and the OCI model in parallel. And we were actually able to test all of our registry operations against the pre-OCI model, the one we were currently running, as well as the OCI model, the one that we were migrating to. And we were actually able to migrate all of Quay.io and our on-prem customers were able to use the same migration in the background without actually having any downtime from by changing our entire, and we were able to change, excuse me, our entire data model without any downtime. Um, I suggest watching that talk because it is pretty fun. Um, and I go into the details of how we do that, but this enabled us to do so. And it enables some really powerful verification moving forward. Uh, I have a quick question, uh, not, sure. about, not about the test, but about the release management for a Quay project. Mm -hmm. uh, what's, a, what's the best way to track a particular Quay version to the GitHub commit? Uh, I look at the uh, release notes stored on the uh, redhat.com, mm -hmm. and um, how, do I, how do I find a, a Git, a corresponding Git release or commit? Yeah, uh, so we are adding, Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we're adding tags for each of the project Quay releases for each sprint. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So we, so we, we, we do pro, so there, there's two different release schedules here. There's the, there's actually three, but so Quay.io gets upgraded or updated routinely, right? So we'll, we'll merge stuff into head. We'll test it. We'll deploy to Quay.io, see if there's any problems, fix them and continue. Um, and that ensures that, you know, we have fast cadence on Quay.io and it, as well as I mentioned earlier, it ensures that we catch problems really early, right? Cause if it works on Quay.io, chances are it'll work at Project Quay. Uh, Project Quay releases occur with our sprints. So our sprints are three weeks and they're named. Um, right now we're naming them after Star Wars because we just wanted a, a cool theme. And so we tag after each sprint, we tag the commit SHA in our GitHub repo, in the Project Quay GitHub repo um, with the commit for that sprint. And we also have a build trigger, actually a Quay IO build trigger that automatically builds that release with that tag and puts it into quayio slash project quay slash quay. Um, so there, our release pipeline today is, is, is to have those sprints. And then Red Hat Quay, our, our, the Red Hat product version of project quay, um, gets numeric releases, our upcoming release being 3.3.0. And those get tagged with their own tags. Uh, you can actually see the, us working towards that today. There is a, a release branch um, in the GitHub that's called 3.3-release, if I recall, or something along those lines. Um, and once we do the actual release, that we will put a 3.3 tag on that. Got it. Thank you for the explanation. And uh, with a, uh, uh, is there uh, any version compatibility metrics for Quay and Claire? Yes. So today, for Red Hat Quay, we release Claire containers along with the Quay container. So when Red Hat Quay 3.3 goes out, a Claire container for 3.3, it'll be called, I believe, Claire-GWT, because it also includes the auth system in it. 
will also be given the tag 3.3, and that will ensures that there's compatibility between those two uh, systems. That being said, um, for Project Quay, um, we don't generally break compatibility with Claire, and if we do, we call it out on our release notes. So as of right now, you can use any version of Claire V2 with Quay, and you should be able to use any version of Claire V4 or modern ones uh, once we start releasing those um, with uh, Quay 3.3. But we are, we are going to be calling out for the project way side when there's compatibility uh, differences and when there's going to be the need to move up or down. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Quick question. Do you support other image scanner uh, projects? So we don't support object, other image scanner projects in so much as we do the work. So Quay itself does not talk to Claire. It talks to what's known as the Quay Security Scanner API. Uh, there's two versions. There's the V2, which is for Claire V2, and now V4, which is for the Claire V4 API. But there's no need, but it doesn't have to be Claire on the other end, right? So we actually have, um, there is a guy who works for um, Aqua who actually implemented a proxy that speaks to Claire V2 API, and Quay talks to that proxy, and that proxy talks to the Aqua Security Scanner, and Quay is none the wiser. And that was a deliberate design decision on our part. Um, we don't generally lock ourselves to Claire. Um, our hope is down the road that we can drive a community effort towards having a standardized security scanner API. And our hope is with some of the work we're doing on Claire v4, which is a more modern version of the Claire v2 API, one based on manifest as opposed to images, we can start proposing some designs around this is how a security scanner talks to a registry and vice versa, because it's a bi-directional relationship. And if that happens, and I'm, I'm very much in favor of doing that, then we would then say, as long as you meet the, the registry security scanner API spec, you can just plug it into Quay or any other registry and Quay will be none the wiser and that's the way it should be. Um, the Claire API is in, is in and of itself, both in V2 and V4, fairly simple on purpose for that reason so that if you do want to write a translator to other security scanners, you can. And we also have other security scanners that have integrated with Quay, not by, via our security scanner APIs, but by making use of our Quay APIs. So what they'll do is they'll call the Quay APIs to determine what has changed in a repository, and then they will scan the image and then annotate the results in Quay by adding a label. So there's at least one uh, security scanner provider whose name is, is, is escaping me at the moment, who has actually already created this kind of integration via our OAuth integration. So you just OAuth over to their scanner to give them access. They scan all of your repos and then they label with a link to the results. And we actually added a change that's going into Quay 3.3, where if you put a URL and a label, it's clickable for that very reason. So that it's now clickable over. Got it. Anything else on this? Okay. Next slide. I think you're up, Bill, but I'm not 100% sure. Yep. Yeah. I'll, why don't I pick it up from here? I know we're also running a little short on time. So um, let me kind of go through some of the customer stuff. Someone asked earlier about who's using uh, Quay. Um, this is just a, a, a snapshot of some of the, the names. Um, I'll go into a little more detail on, on the Ford uh, reference in a second. Um, but we, we've had... Uh, Obviously, Quay has been been used commercially for for a long time. You know, as Joey said, we we are recently open sourced. We open sourced back in November of last year for Quay. Claire was open sourced back in 2015. So, as a as a registry, we're fairly new to the open source scene, um, but we have existed prior to that. Um, I also threw down some stats on Quay.io. So Joey mentioned about the scalability. I, th I think it's relevant in in the discussion around usage um, around the scale at which Quay.io operates. So we we do um, uh, cater to almost 100,000 users, um, as well as uh, over 7,000 organizations. And an organization and a user are kind of the same thing inside Quay. They just um, represent differently on the UI. We've also got um, close to uh, 150,000 plus robot accounts accessing the service. So again, if we haven't kind of beaten this point to death, you know, Quay.io was built for scale. Um, it runs at scale, and, and that's something that we spend a lot of time on in the engineering team, making sure that we don't break that uh, design commitment, as well as making sure that our service runs um, adequately at scale. Um, Red Hat, as a company, uh, now depends on Quay.io for, for um, a vast majority of its container distribution needs. 
Let me move on to just quickly talk about Ford. So uh, I, I, we have some reference information that came out actually just last week with virtual summit um, that took place. Um, so there's a PDF here and there's a link you can read up on. Um, I, I just want to call out the usage here of Quay. Um, obviously they're, they're using the Red Hat Quay product, but as Joey said, it's the same bits as Project Quay. Uh, they're a long time customer of Quay. They began their um, involvement with Quay uh, back when Quay was part of CoreOS. Um, they're currently running on a fairly old version of Quay actually. Um, and um, it's a fairly modest sized deployment. Um, I'll say single digit terabytes of, of storage. It's, it's not, a, not our largest deployment by any stretch. Um, but in terms of the, the use case, um, it is a centralized registry that's um, handling uh, lots of application uh, needs within Ford. Um, they also provide a facility for partners to access those images as well. So there's, a, there's an external component as well. Um, again, I won't spend too much time on this. If you have specific questions, if we can answer those about Ford, we'll try to do that. But I would encourage you to take a look at that PDF. Um, it, is, it is fairly OpenShift centric, obviously, but um, Quay is, is a part of that story. Let me just jump into the community briefly as well. As I mentioned before, uh, Quay is fairly new to being open sourced. We just completed that activity in November of last year. Um, we've seen pretty good uptick already. Um, you know, the numbers are, are, are there. We've got 47 contributors. We've got, um, you can see an extraordinarily large number of commits, obviously because of the historic work that we did. We basically took the existing Git repo uh, kept our commit history and and opened that up. So um, we preserve the uh, the historical aspects of that. Um, we've already got uh, quite a few forks. We're starting to get the GitHub stars up uh, and we're starting to get increased views uh, and visitors there. So that's a growing thing. We see that um, growing pretty much on a weekly basis. Um, our our um, our SIG channel on, on Google has been getting more traction and as an engineering team, we are uh, I would say on a weekly basis, increasing our involvement with the community and vice versa. Um, on the Claire side, there's uh, some, some slightly different numbers. Uh, it's a bit longer, obviously it began as an open source project. Um, larger number of contributors there, um, obviously not as much commit activity, but again, you can see just the, the stats kind of speak for themselves there in terms of how much uh, usage there. We do have I guess I'll just sort of summarize in terms of uh, who's working on Claire versus Quay. From a Red Hat perspective, we too do have some full-time employees on Claire. We have two, uh, we have four full-time employees on Quay. Um, and that kind of fits into the contributor model there. Let me just pause there. Are there any questions about that? Yeah, I had one. Um, are, are all of those maintainers in those projects from Red Hat or, or is there some kind of company diversity across those projects? On the Quay side, it's predominantly Red Hat, obviously, because it's recently just open sourced. Um, we are looking to extend that uh, as quickly as possible to be beyond Red Hat. On the Claire side, I, it's, uh, I believe only three of the maintainers are Red Hat employees. Thank you. Yeah, I should also comment on the Claire side that um, Amazon is using Claire V2 currently as part of their security scanning system, and they've been uh, actively contributing as a result. Um, we're we're excited for them to move to contributing to Claire v4 um, as we shift uh, development resources for, from the old version to the new one as well. Yep. Let me just uh, wrap up with the roadmap um, just to give you a sense of where we're going. Um, so uh, Helm v3 is something that we've got experimental support for in our next release, which is coming out um, very, very soon, uh, like next week. <laughs> uh, we'll GA that. Uh, fairly quickly thereafter, um, hopefully um, in the next ma uh, minor release dot release that we can do for Quay. Um, we'll obviously have upstream support hardened over time much faster. Um, we will be getting the full certification for OCI compliance. You know, as Joey went into detail about the test uh, compliance there, we feel pretty strongly that we're going to be first out of the gate with that. Um, we're also pushing very hard on the artifact support. So um, in conjunction to compliance, we'll look to have early access for OCI artifact support as quickly as we can. Um, we're also um, working on something fairly new, which is around um, a novel pub sub model for registry events. Um, this is a proposal that we've, we've authored and we've taken to the community. We're looking for feedback on that and uh, we would be interested in getting community engagement on helping to implement that as part of Project Quay. We think that's gonna go a long way towards solving some of the scalability issues around event notification for working with registries at scale, especially the scale of Quay.io. 
Uh, Joey mentioned the notary v2 work that we're doing. We're staying very close to that effort. And as we have something available, we'll get that into the product. Um, from a feature perspective, uh, this is coming from a lot of our customers. We've gotten a lot of requests for um, sort of enterprise management uh, facilities around large scale usage, for example, quota, uh, enforcement and management of quota for images and repos, making sure that um, organizations don't run out of storage or run out of uh, scalability um, in, in, in uh, constrained environments. Um, we've also got quite a few requirements for working in controlled environments, financial services institutions, public sector institutions, where there have to be air-gapped environments. There may not be direct connections to uh, the, the internet. Um, day two occupies quite a bit of our roadmap just around how we want people to be able to run Quay on-premise uh, in, in a cloud environment without touching it. So this um, obviously fits into the model for um, our operator strategy, but we really see day two and beyond and day two plus as being um, major functional use cases for backup, um, resiliency, recovery, um, any sort of operator centric uh, and operation centric use cases. Um, and then lastly, just to touch on from a development perspective, we see that um, the continued integration, deep integration with Kube is, is really paramount. So we would exist primarily to serve applications on Kube. And so that's everything from how does Quay gets smarter about understanding what's currently running on a cube cluster to prevent accidental issues with, say, image deletion or image changes that may affect production runtime. Um, also, obviously, staying very close to CI/CD uh, workflows, making sure that those different tools and different um, uh, workflows for development work very well with Quay, above and beyond just the build support we have today. And then the last one I'll just briefly touch on is this notion of image proxy, um, where Quay can provide image proxy at the cube cluster level to provide additional resilience in the event that the, the registry goes down. I know there was a question before about HA and, and making sure that the registry doesn't go away. Um, having a proxy support that's intelligent enough to work with um, a highly available cube and keeping things cached at the, at the node level is, uh, is something that we're looking at. So I, I blew that pretty fast. Are there any questions about the roadmap? Yeah, I had one again. Uh, <laughs> seems to be my place in the world. Um, the the some of the the stuff on your roadmap you could probably either you know implement yourself or just build sort of plugins to existing systems. So PubSub, for example, there are many of them out there. You could just uh, publish stuff to any number of PubSub systems. Uh, similar, you know, Quota. We have this open policy agent in the CNCF, etc. Is your, is your general approach to kind of integrate with existing solutions or build them yourself or some hybrid of the two? I, yeah. I, How about I, I talk to that, Bill, if you're Yeah, okay. go for it, Joey. Yeah, so, so on the PubSub side, the reason that I, I, so I'm the author of the PubSub proposal, part of the reason that, that I, I'm feeling that it would, should be a separate proposal is because the idea is to allow registries to implement it kind of the way they want. Um, I don't, I'm not a fan of APIs that are tied to specific implementation. So the PubSub API proposal is like you want to back it using an existing PubSub model or you want to use like RabbitMQ or whatever you can. Um, Quay.io would probably do it a bit differently than on-prem Quay, for example. Um, other areas where we endeavor, or, or rather I should say, we endeavor to reuse community um, resources wherever possible, um, but we try to do so in a way that is pluggable so that we're not in requiring our users to make to, to use a specific piece of technology at least wherever possible um, and then and therefore get themselves boxed in so like as we mentioned earlier like you have options of storage if you want to you have options for databases you have options for log drivers you have options for um, mirroring and you know down the road for quota and for PubSub in all of these cases our, our plan is to allow our users to determine what the best piece of infrastructure is for their needs and then hopefully build a sufficiently powerful but also somewhat generic implementation on top of it that make that that leverages the unique capabilities of each of these systems um, it's it's a very fine balance to hold I will admit um, but we, we endeavor to do it wherever possible um, so you know that that that's the general goal of, of us adding new stuff we, we integrate where we can um, and where it provides value. Um, and then we write our own where we feel that there isn't a sufficient community or sufficient existing um, effort that meets the needs of our customers. 
Thank you. That makes sense. Thanks, Joey. Any other roadmap questions? Or I guess I can just say at this point, are there any questions in general? That's the, our last slide. So in terms of the community, uh, do you have a roadmap for, uh, you know, including more contributors from different organizations? Um, you know, it's more, more, sp more specifically a roadmap uh, item. I, mean, I think you, you, you mentioned it uh, before, right? But uh, if there's some effort towards that or? Um, yeah, it's a good question. So uh, we don't call that out as a roadmap item specifically. There is initiatives um, that we're running to get community engagement um, around Quay um, specifically. Um, yeah, we can talk to some of those things and, and Diane, who's on, on the line as well, I think can talk that. Um, a lot of it is around right now, making sure that we have not just an outreach program, but making sure that we're getting um, significant value to the community. So the upstream releases are the first step towards that. We want to make sure that people get access to the latest and greatest um, changes to Quay as quickly as possible coming from our team. We've also started folding in, obviously, um, and, and accepting uh, PRs from the, from the community. Our first PR actually was quite interesting. It was a, a fellow who ran uh, a code formatter on our code um, and sort of helped us just get the code looking really nice. Um, so, so yeah, it, it, it's sort of implied in what we're doing. I don't think we've called out specific roadmap items to say get X number of contributors by this date, um, but it's primarily making sure that we, as a as the Project Quay team, uh, are 100% uh, focused on the community. So I don't know if that helps or not. Yeah. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'll I guess we'll we'll hand it back to you, Ricardo. And I appreciate you giving us. Uh, the entire meeting at this rate. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Yeah, so I think the next step will be to um, basically um, the SIG is going to create a document, rec uh, recommendation document, and uh, that will be publicly available. And then uh, after that, uh, the TOC will since the FTOC will uh, look at the document and then they need to find a TOC due diligence sponsor uh, because you guys are going for incubation, right? So, uh, and then um, from there, that person will drive the due diligence and, and then everything goes well, then uh, it finally goes to a vote and then, and then it becomes part of the CNCF. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so I think uh, we, we had one last item, but we didn't get to it. So uh, that was uh, CDI, Container Device Interface. So uh, Renal added it to the next uh, meeting. So that will be our first item for the next meeting. And that's it. I think we don't have anything else. So uh, thank you very much. And yeah, and stay healthy and, you know, and stay home. Have a great one. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a good day, everyone. Stay safe.